Welcome to Comics Bazaar, the channel of comics commentary and arcana. This video features the Uncanny X-Men number 292, cover dated September 1992. So quite an action-packed, colourful cover here by Brandon Peterson, um, upcoming uh, new regular artist on the title from um, issue number 294. So we're still in this interregnum period after Will's uh, Portacio's departure to Image. And we've got uh, Bishop, uh, Jean Grey and Colossus here. Though, if you didn't know uh, the contents of the previous issue, you wouldn't know who is attacking them or who they're defending themselves from. But it happens to be the Morlocks, so uh, no time for a cover caption here either. Um, nice enough cover, very kind of 90s um, image style really, and inked by Joe Rubenstein. So let's open up the issue and um, turn to our splash page. So Tom Rainey, still a guest fill-in artist here. This is a nice opening splash page. It turns out the trio here are up on the uh, big screen in Times Square. So this issue picks up directly uh, after the end of the previous issue with the Morlocks escaping through. Um, a hole blasted right under um, Midtown Manhattan, Times Square, uh, blasted by uh, Storm, who had been overwhelmed by her um her um claustrophobia and so broke her way out to the surface and now the morlocks here are emerging from their underground abode so uh what happens is that uh the trio here are um uh, determining what to do next and bishop of course um our um time displaced uh, future xse soldier uh determines to go um, uh, guns firing um, up against the Morlocks and we'll see how that turns out uh, subsequently. So the title of this story, The Morlocks Take Manhattan and the creative team, Scott Lobdell Ryder, Rurik Tyler Layouts and Tom Rainey Penciler. So penciling over Tyler's layouts. Joe Rubenstein and Al Milgram um, inkers. So we start with Rubenstein and at a certain point I'll indicate when we uh, turn over to Milgram. And that's, oh, and uh, we've got Lois Buhalis and Tom Orzakowski letterers. So the fact that we've got tag team um, inkers and letterers here and a layout artist and penciler indicates that this issue was uh, turned around uh, very quickly, uh, deadline style. So uh, what happens here, Bishop going after the Morlocks with guns blazing? Well, uh, Colossus intervenes. This is nicely done here. So he grabs uh, Bishop by the shirt and grabs the, uh, the rifle from him and tells him basically, uh, this is not the way the X-Men work. And this has been a lesson that Bishop has been learning um, over the last few um, months, um, issues wise uh, with the X-Men. And um, Jean Grey here is telling uh, the two guys to uh, uh, exercise some self-control. And um, let's continue because we've got a scene shift to the expansion. And we also have picking up from a cliffhanger at the end of the previous issue. Uh, Mikael has come down to free Callisto from the restraints in the med lab. And obviously he's uh, taking a swing at Iceman. And Iceman here um, ridicules Mikael that he's not really the most uh, likely qualified to dispense psychiatric advice. So this isn't really a way to win over or calm down Mikael. And so he blasts Iceman um, with his power. And we get an explanation of what his power is. So his mutant ability is to channel all manner of energy to transform matter from one state into another. And so what he's done here is he's transformed um, Iceman into water, ice to water. Uh, so pretty uh, horrifying there for Iceman. And then we uh, catch up with um, Archangel who hasn't flown to the surface. Instead he stayed down in the Morlock tunnels and he has gone to the scene of um, a horrific episode in his own life when his uh, natural wings were removed and as he thinks to himself here the place where Warren Worthington the third died and the creature known as Archangel was born so this was back in X Factor, X -Factor 15 but um, eagle-eyed eagle readers will see that this is rather the dace that uh, Archangel or Angel rather was strung um, up to 
back in Uncanny X-Men 169, uh, the first appearance of the Morlocks. So there's a little bit of miscommunication here between writer and artist in terms of visually what we're seeing here um, in, the, in the comic. And then we pick up with Professor X, who has uh, perceived telepathically that there is a traumatized Morlock with psychic abilities who is the cause of the Morlocks going um, crazy. And here he is here. So he's located him, but he's um, hidden down this uh, little uh, tunnel um, um, beneath uh, Manhattan. And um, he knows that uh, the only hope of sedating the Morlocks lies in calming this particular Morlock child. So then we go back above ground um, to uh, uh, Times Square. If you look very closely here, you see these uh, kind of risque pictures in the background. So kind of indicating in 1992 Times Square hadn't yet been cleaned up. Um, still was a bit of a louche um, area in Manhattan. Um, and here we have this horrifying um, uh, image here of this particular Morlock whose powers is to absorb the bodies of his victims. So Colossus happens on him and uh, starts to tackle him physically. And of course, because Colossus is organic steel, uh, this, Morlock power, this Morlock's powers isn't able to work on Colossus. And here we've got a pretty cool anchor image of the battle between the two. And um, Colossus is concerned about doing damage to the innocent hostages who are in uh, this Morlock's, he calls himself Mimi, in his body. So Jean um, telekinetically removes bystanders uh, from uh, risk and uh, thinks here, this is uh, an interesting little mistake slip up um, on Lobdell's part where Jean says, all oh, the reason I need to telepathically remove the father, father from the Morlock's grasp, but of course she's using her TK, her telekinesis powers. And here she thinks um, anguishedly that because that she can only think of one way to stop uh, the Morlock Mimi, and um, as she thinks, and heaven help us both if she has no choice. So we'll see how that pans out later on in the issue. And then we uh, catch up again with Bishop, and this is a nice little scene here. So it's an action scene, but a little bit of characterization as well going on. So Bishop is um, spent in terms of his projected energy reserves. So he tricks the uh, Morlocks into um, using a bioblast against them. As he says here, I'm managing to take them on physically, but if even one of you possessed a bioblast, who boy, would I be in trouble? So he tricks them. So one of them um, does blast him here and that charges him up with energy again. Um, so as he says here, they're gullible and easily manipulated. Um, interesting little um, uh, color uh, issue here um, with actually I forgot to uh, mention it's Steve Bucciolato on colors here so it looks like he thought he was coloring this character or even this one when it's actually Bishop um, so he's colored him um, in a lime green there so uh, a little bit of mistake and again an indication that this issue was probably put together um, in a rush to beat the deadline for the printers um, because even the coloring here looks quite uh, speedy like there's no care taken over it and at this point too um, definitely this page um, and I think this one too we've switched over to Al, Al Milgram on inks so the inking a little cruder um, probably again um, to be fair to him probably having to turn around these pages uh, very quickly. So the police turn up and they remember um, Bishop from um, the executions, assassinations of the future criminals in issues 284 to 288 and they want to take him in for questioning. So um, how is he going to respond uh, to the arrival of the police? And then we go back to the X mansion and this is pretty cool. So we've got Iceman here um, using um, or, or having had his powers boosted uh, by Mikael 
um, who says to Bobby, uh, he's, he's doing nothing other than to help Iceman achieve the full potential of his mutant abilities. Imagine the possibilities of a body constructed completely of ice. So this is Iceman made completely of ice instead of the external casing of ice, which you've been content to wear as a manifestation of your powers. This is the legacy of your genetic birth, birthright, Iceman. Um, so this is something that does get explored during uh, Lobdell's tenure on Uncanny X-Men, and we see um, a different kind of 90s version of Iceman coming soon. Uh, so pretty cool that this is the uh, origin of that um, new version of Iceman, pure ice. Um, but what happens is that Mikael basically uh, rips Iceman to uh, ice shards. And, um, well, of course, we're going to wonder whether Iceman survives that. And upstairs, um, in the attic atrium that serves as Storm's apartment... Uh, Callisto is going through Storm's things and looking for her old um, leather uh, jacket um, which Storm took from her as a trophy and symbol of uh, winning leadership over the Morlocks back in Uncanny X-Men 170. So Callisto determines that it's only fitting that she wear the jacket again when she destroys the Morlocks. So she's still intent on um, destroying the Morlocks. And then we pick up with Professor X who's making his way, he's gotten out of his, um, his automated wheelchair which is too wide to come down this little tunnel. And so he's gotten on his, um, gotten down into the dirt and is dragging his legs behind him. And he's thinking here that, uh, uh, as he says out loud, and yes, Gene, to answer your unspoken question, there are times he despises his useless legs. So picking up on the fact that he's lost the use of his legs again, back in Uncanny X-Men uh, 100, and, uh, sorry, 280. Um, nice little use of um, uh, um, screen tones here. So obviously a bit more time for this page. And I think that this page was inked, uh, those little tick marks there. Uh, indicated ink by Joe Rubenstein. So, um, yeah, Rubenstein having a little bit more time, taking more time over his pages. Again, we've got the screen tone there, and it's a nice effect. But we've got this uh, horrific moment where Professor X realizes that he has injured his legs. Um, so whether it's that he's got no feeling in his legs or not, and um, he has uh, he's bleeding, so he has to... Uh, tie his leg up just as he arrives at the point um, of getting to the traumatized uh, young Morlock child. Um, and then we go back to Bishop, um, who has decided to blast away at the, um, at the NYPD officers. But then Storm finally, it seems, has gotten a grip on her claustrophobia, and she arrives to... Um, to stop Bishop um, from um, killing the police officer. She blows them out of the way of his blasts and she tells him that her patience is wearing thin with his constant overreacting to every threat. These officers were doing their job. So this is a rerun of an argument they've had before um, a few times and uh, Storm tells him that they're going to talk about it again and Bishop looking dejected um, asks rhetorically, why don't I doubt that? So. Then what happens is we pick up with Mimi again and Colossus is beating him down but suddenly uh, Mimi um, uh, falls apart and uh, the humans he'd absorbed into his body are freed from him and Colossus, Colossus asks Jean, asks her rather, um, you know, what's happened and she says she happened and she says there was no other way, it was there in his thoughts, he was stalling. Another moment and his victims would have been trapped forever. I had ni neither the time nor the ability to be subtle. And so she's saying there was no other option. She had to telepathically reach in and turn off his mind. So that is to say she killed him. Um, interesting, like, uh, like a final uh, resort. And it kind of like parallels, um, interestingly, the whole other situation with Bishop, Bishop is used to using lethal force and the whole argument coming his way 
from both Colossus and Storm is not to use lethal force. And here Jean is being forced into uh, taking the life of this uh, Morlock. There being, as far as she could see, no other alternative. And then we pick up with Professor X and he manages to make physical contact with the Morlock child. His name is Kevin, his code name Brain Cell. And um, he explains to the child, I merely added my strength to your own Kevin, thereby allowing your fellow Morlocks to act out of their own accord. And it turns out Mask was behind everything. Uh, so uh, Kevin says, but the thoughts Mask placed in my mind and the horror I inflicted upon my brethren. Professor X says, it's past, now's the time for healing. Rest child and know you are forgiven. So this is a consequence of uh, Mask's doing ultimately a mass dying in X-Force number seven. Um, so then we go back to topside uh, Times Square and the Morlocks now that uh, Kevin's um, traumatized uh, psychic um, interference has been calmed and stopped, decide to go back into their uh, tunnels. And Bishop asks Jean, uh, what should their course of action be? And she says, uh, they may be out of sight, but they're also still out of control. We have to find some way to stop them before they do something we'll all regret. And so Bishop uh, descends into the tunnels once again, saying, we'll stop them, Jean, if I have to pound each and every one of them into unconsciousness myself. Okay, so quite the macho boast there from Bishop. And then we pick up at the end, back at the X-Mansion. So Callisto has changed her costume. She's got her old leather jacket on. And um, Mikael here is still injured um, from the blast he took from um, Iceman. Iceman, it turns out, is not dead, but out cold. And Mikael says that um, he cannot bring himself to willfully take the life of another. And then Callisto kisses him and says, really, we'll have to work on that. So then our next issue caption promises that Warren's going to learn the devastating truth about his wings in the last Morlock story. So the letters pages here deals with um, primarily uh, issue 287 and uh, there you go. So I do hope that you enjoyed this review and commentary on Uncanny X-Men 292. If you did, please like the video. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for more content like this.